So you can picture this Rolls Royce pulling up behind like a Safeway store. These three or four teenage girls in cut off shorts getting out, getting into the trash bin and filling up the trunk of the Rolls Royce with uh, damaged produce. But he loved it and uh, because it was a wonderful way to feed a lot of people for no money. And interestingly enough, he was inspired to write a song about it. So Charlie, I know you were impatient. And this is oh, garbage dump. Oh, garbage dump. Why you call a garbage dump? Oh, garbage dump. Oh, garbage dump. Why? Oh, it goes on a long time. I don't need to play anymore. It already did. Pardon me? It already did go on. It went on too long. But anyway, let's talk about his techniques of control. There's some absurdity in this, but the fact was he was manipulating and controlling and doing great damage to children. Um, Margaret Singer was my mentor. I know Jeannie, you'd met her, I'm sure. I, and um, in any case, she'd written kind of the definitive books on cults, but she really narrowed it down to this. Keep the people unaware of what's going on and the changes taking place. These were teenagers, damaged children. They did not know that Manson had a secret agenda, which was actually to take over the United States create a sense of powerlessness, covert fear, and dependency. He was very brutal to the, these children. They were isolated, for one thing. He'd, uh, they lived in a school bus until that their family got too big. And then he found this horse ranch out on the outskirts of Los Angeles called the Spawn Ranch, where some of the <coughs> some uh, low-grade westerns were filmed in the 40s and 50s. And they rented out horses on weekends to people from LA who wanted to get out in the country. So he went up to George Spahn, who was pretty much blind, and said, can we live out here on the ranch? And, uh, and we'll help out, and you don't have to pay us. And he initially said no, and then he said, well, you know, I'll give you one of the girls to live with while I'm doing it. And so he said, yeah, sure, OK. George was like 80 years old, so he squeaky from became essentially his caretaker. And they were totally cut off. Um, <clears throat> he didn't allow them to use uh, George Spahn's telephone. They didn't get a newspaper. Uh, he controlled radio and television religiously. I mean, that's a bad term. He, he controlled it brutally, essentially. Uh, and they were afraid of him because he was brutal. Uh, and he wanted to break them down even further. And remember, 15, the, the vast majority of the Manson family were high school or middle school age. And so the way the meals went at the Manson family was the men ate first, then the children, then the dogs, than the women. And uh, they were really cut off. And to kind of break down their identity even further, they weren't allowed to own anything, not even a toothbrush. All the toothbrushes were communal. You just grab whichever one was handy. Yes? I'm just curious, who were the men? Was it just Manson and the property owner? Were there other Oh, I thank you for that. He always had more women than men. He was, um, on top of being a racist, he was a misogynist as well. He had a few men with him. Um, uh, Tex Watson was one. He had a few. Uh, we're going to actually see a clip of one of um, Paul Watkins was really a second-hand man. And Paul Watkins was very fortunate because he was able to get out of the Manson family in a particularly novel way. Uh, who, 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 and the children? Who were they? When I say the children, I'm talking of, actually they did have uh, Manson. There were children born to the Manson family. Uh, they were born at home home delivery, uh, not a big believer in hospitals. But when somebody joined the Manson family, their license, driver's license was also confiscated. So he really had pretty good control of them. Um, suppressed much of the person's old behavior and attitudes, and still new behaviors and attitudes. Put forth a closed system of logic and allow no real emperor to criticism. So if you said to Charlie, you know, it's a nice fantasy that you're going to be the fifth beetle, but you know, that's not it's unlikely. If you were, <clears throat> if somebody was foolish enough to say that, he would just punch them. Um, he, or uh, he used to, he was very good with a machete. And one of his favorite things was to have one of the girls, I call them girls, because we always think of the Manson girls here, young women, stand up against hay bales. And he would throw the machete to see how close he could get to them. Um, and he'd control the person's time and physical environment. They were isolated. They didn't have access to public transportation or cars. They didn't have a driver's license. They didn't have any money. And they were constantly, constantly preached to by Manson. Um, 
And the other aspect of it, and he was kind of a pioneer in this, I'll give him his due, he realized that two ways he could control his people were through LSD and marijuana. Uh, not talking about people take marijuana for physical illness or people sm maybe smoke marijuana now and again for the relaxation and kind of indifferent to that. They were heavy marijuana smokers. They were always under the influence of marijuana. And um, always, and that made them more susceptible. They took LSD in these ritualistic LSD ceremonies. Um, heavy marijuana use, it's important to recognize that they were very, very heavy marijuana users. These are not casual people who might have one or two joints a day even. They smoked it all the time. And LSD, you know, dreamlike imagery, um, magical thinking. And he was also, if you were familiar with the Milgram study, which yeah. is a particularly, particularly horrific study that could never be done ethically now. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I could spend a few minutes on it. Do we have enough time, do you think? I think maybe. Move along. Probably everybody's familiar with it. Oh, okay, it. good. That's right. I'm speaking to a skeptical crowd. I'm not, I don't have to explain what the Milgram study is. Prison um, An isolation, very big big thing. This was before the family got too big. They were still living on the bus. You can see Susan Atkins in the background. She died of uh, brain cancer, I don't know, four or five years ago, still incarcerated. And there's the Spawn Movie Ranch where they live. And I want to talk about their LSD rituals because it's pretty interesting. Remember, they're heavily influenced by constant marijuana smoking. They, they would do these rituals. They had an empty building at the Spawn Movie Ranch. They would all take LSD except Manson. As near as can be determined, he took it one time, and it was a very bad experience for him, but he recognized its power. So he, they would all take LSD. They'd all be completely nude. Uh, so you can picture the self-consciousness that a teenager experiences anyway. And they're on LSD. He sits in the middle, and, and he plays music for them, and he lectures them, and he preaches to them. And then the culmination, of, well, the, not quite the culmination, but after this had been going on for a couple of hours, they all stuck, got up and they sang and they followed Manson outside. He already had a cross there and uh, with a hole dug and they would tie Charles Manson on the cross and then they would put him cross in the hole and then they would all sing songs to Charles Manson while he's up on the cross. And you got to think about it, Charles Manson, man's son, because he was saying and it's um. the fact that he was God. And then they would go back in and they would have an orgy. But what he was particularly adept at is if somebody was heterosexual, he would make sure they had homosexual sex and vice versa. And it was a whole thing was to totally confuse them when they're in this state of LSD, marijuana, intoxication. Uh, one of his new followers, he found out something really interesting. One of his new followers said, hey, my aunt has a ranch in Death Valley. Nobody's living there. So that's perfect because that's where the, the bottomless pit is. And, and as the race riots get in closer and closer, the best be ready. And so what they started doing is they started stealing dune buggies. And because um, they were going to need the dune buggies when they got to the desert. Um, and Volkswagens, and they, he befriended a biker group, um, I think they were called Satan Slaves, I believe, and uh, they were mechanics, they were good mechanics, and they were also drug dealers, and he said, look, you know, help me cut these Volkswagens down, help me do this, and you can hang out and have sex with any of the girls you want, and so it's a pretty good deal for the bikers, so they had all of these, and they were shipping them up to, it would not surprise me if there's still one or two stashed up there somewhere, because they had a lot of them. Uh, here's Charles, uh, Paul Watkins talking about, Watkins was Charles Manson's right-hand man, and he was fortunate because while Manson was gone and he was living up, at, the family was up in the desert, he met somebody who was able to convince him to leave the Manson family, and he did. I mean, ironically, the man was a Scientologist, but even still, <laughs> he, uh, and uh, Watkins did not. They have a purpose. <laughs> Pardon me? They have a purpose. Scientology's yeah, know, done something know, right. Yeah, There's one. Yeah. There's one thing. <laughs> but in any case, this is Watkins. This was filmed during the trial. This was 1970. This was Charlie's trial. He bred fear of people. Are we talking about? Anything that you might be afraid of, if it's some sort of sex or if it's some sort of physical harm or some sort of thought, whatever he could find that you would fear, he would play on. You are to mold the hippie movement into something. He said there's a 
his music would take all the, the young love and program them to go somewhere else, to go out into the desert. They would make a huge tribe out there of 144,000. Then we would steal dune buggies by the hundreds and mount machine guns on top of the dune buggies and the girls would drive the dune buggies while the guys shot the machine guns. We'd swoop down on the towns and kill everyone that wasn't beautiful. <laughs> wow, quite a, quite a method, eh? So again, I just want to mention again his methods of control, isolation, physical and emotional abuse. Think of the women having to eat after the dogs. That's pretty horrific. Uh, trying to destroy any sense of self-esteem, totally cut them off from their families who were perceived as the enemy. Um, sexual degradation, <laughs> poverty, heavy drug use. Um, but things are getting out of control for Manson because John Lennon and Paul McCartney still haven't called him. He's done all of uh, the um, Terry Melcher. He's had done a big favor for Manson because he'd given him almost unlimited studio time, which is a pretty. If you want to record music and go into a professional studio, it costs you a lot of money. Manson didn't have to do that. Melcher set him up. So, in the very unlikely event that anybody here is curious to hear any more Manson music, there's tons of it on YouTube. Okay. okay. Um, so a lot of things are going on. Uh, now um, Melcher and Dennis Wilson don't want anything to do with Manson because they liked it when he was peace and love and they could have sex with the girls, but now he's talking violence and race wars and racism and death and things are getting kind of bad. Um, and uh, then he w worked out this deal uh, when I talked about, um, God, and now I totally blanked out on his name, he was the first murder victim. He was a he was a doctoral student. Was it at UCLA or US or uh, University of Southern California? I forgot. And he was a musician, and he was also an amateur chemist who would make mescaline. And so he sold Manson a bunch of mescaline, which Manson then sold to the bikers. The bikers came back and they wanted their money back um, because they said the mescaline wasn't any good. And so they showed up at the guy's house, and he thought the Manson family were his friends. They often spent the night at his place in Topaga Canyon. It still exists, but as you can see, it's been, it, at the time, it was just a tiny little two-story hippie house. Now, of course, it's probably owned by a movie star. But, and uh, he, they wanted their money back, and he said, I don't have the money. And uh, his name was Gary Hinman, thank you, I blanked out. So they tied Gary Hinman up, and they tortured him for two days. And ultimately, uh, Manson used his machete to cut off Gary Hinman's ear. Then he felt a little remorse, so he sewed the ear back on with uh, dental floss. And when uh, Hinman insisted that I don't have any money, he told Bobby Buzalil to kill him, and he did. And uh, that caused a little problem because Bobby Buzalil was actually arrested not long after that. And um, a lot of things were going on with Manson at that point, and he didn't. He thought he could maybe divert attention away from Bobby, who said he was innocent, even though he was driving Gary Hinman's car, and the and the Myrtle <coughs> weapon that he'd stabbed to death with was in the trunk. But anyway, uh, so he thought he could do some sort of vague copycat killing, and he'd actually, interestingly, Manson had been at this home once before, and uh, at one point. Terry Melcher, if he didn't live there, he was there a lot. So Manson knew this house, and it was uh, being rented by uh, Polanski and Sharon Tate. So what he did is he sent Tex Watson, <coughs> Susan Atkins, Patricia Quinnwinkle, and Linda Kasabian, which is an interesting choice because she'd only been with the family a very short amount of time, just a few weeks, a month or so. And he told them to go kill the people that were in that house. And they did. There was. Uh, a caretaker's cottage. The caretaker got a small stipend of amount of money every month. He was just a kid himself, like 18, 19 years old. And, uh, and he just had to look after the property, mow the lawns, water the lawns and stuff. And he had a buddy uh, who he'd met who came by to visit him, Stephen Parent. And uh, Stephen Parent had a clock radio he was hoping to sell to his friend. And Fred said, no, you know, I don't really want the radio, but you know, once you have a beard, and they hung out, and then Stephen Parent got in his car, and I remember Stephen Parent's 18 years old, he's gonna to go to community college in a couple of weeks. He got into his car to drive out, but unfortunately, when he got to the gate of the mansion, the Manson family, Tex Watson, got out and shot him in the head, killed him with a uh, 22. Poor 18 years old, Jesus. And uh, this is the inside of the house. The house has since been torn down and totally, a brand new house is there now. 
Uh, the first one they got was Jay Sebring because they were roughing up Sharon Tate, and Sebring says, hey, leave her alone, you know, she's pregnant, she's my friend, so they killed Sebring first. Farkowski put up quite a fight, you know, he'd been an <coughs> active opponent of the communist rule, he was a tough guy, and they put up a big fight. Ultimately, he was overpowered and he was stabbed to death. Abigail Folger was able to get all the way out into the yard and uh, before she was tackled by Patricia Kringlewinkel, and when the coroner could not determine the color of her white nightgown because it was totally red from the blood. The last one to die was Sharon Tate. She was nine plus months pregnant. And then they wrote some stuff just to confuse the cops because they were hoping the police would think it was the blacks who done it. This was during the race riots and um, a lot of black revolutionary stuff going on, and he figured he could divert the police and make it think it was the African-Americans who had done it, that way it might just trigger the uh, race war that he was sure was going to happen. Interestingly, uh, the caretaker, Bill, blanking out on his last name right now, he claimed he slept all the way through it. Very unlikely. His friend was shot with a 22 just yards away from his house. He heard the screams. Uh, he heard yelling and screaming. Linda Kasabian was out in the yard watching, keeping watch to make sure the police didn't come. Uh, so when the police did come the next day, they arrested him initially, and he said he slept through it. My personal belief is that that's absolutely untrue. I imagine he heard, saw his friend shot, and like an 18 or 19-year-old kid was scared to death, and he probably went and hid in the bushes while it was all going on. He claims to this day that he didn't know what was happening. He's still living. Um, so they got back to the house at the Spawn Ranch and they told Charles Manson about it. He was really ticked off because they'd been so messy. They'd allowed all this screaming and they'd used a gun and that's noisy and that created havoc. And he said, you know, I'll show you how it's done. So they drove around the upscale, upper, upper middle class neighborhood, 3301 Waverly Drive. He did not know the Lovayankos. They were just, he was out in the grocery supermarkets. And uh, Manson came in with one of his followers and um, surprised him, tied him up and said, don't worry, uh, we're not gonna hurt you, we're just gonna rob you. And then he left and told the family to kill him, and they did. Uh, before they left, just to confuse things, look what they wrote, Helter Skelter. Misspelled. Uh, they misspelled Helter, however. Yes, well, Manson didn't write that, but he probably would have spelled it the same way. Uh, and uh, then they were back at the Spawn Ranch. They were still getting ready for Helter Skelter. They were still stockpiling weapons, lots of weapons, lots of dune buggies, lots of stolen vehicles. That's what they did. And, um, but there have been a lot of reports about this hippie group out at the Spawn Ranch who were stealing cars and stockpiling weapons. Uh, somebody tipped the cops off, so they, they got a search warrant. And uh, to bust them, and uh, they decided the best thing they could do is show up real late at night when everybody's sleeping, which they did, and they found guns and they found stolen cars. The problem was they got there so late at night, it was after midnight, a new day, and the search warrant was only good oh. for one day. So, uh, so figuratively speaking, Manson family dodged a bullet there. Uh, they, did oh, they did confiscate the door, however. The door says it all. This was a door from the Spawn Ranch. This is stuff from um, the White Album. For those of you who are Beatles people as opposed to Stones people, Helter Skelter. Um, this is a door from the Spawn Ranch. There was another, there were other ranch hands at Spawn Ranch too, and Shorty Shea was one of them. They didn't like Shorty Shea for a couple reasons. One, he was married to an African-American woman and, and Manson was a racist, so that automatically made him suspect. Also, uh, Shorty Shea did not like the Manson family, and he'd been pressuring George Vaughn to kick the Manson family off, off the ranch. <clears throat> they also suspected that perhaps Shorty Shea had tipped the cops off about the stolen cars and the vehicles. So we had two of his followers, Bruce Davis and Steve Grogan, <clears throat> kill Shorty Shea. Bruce Davis is actually was uh, granted parole, but it's being appealed now. He's still in prison. Steve Grogan, who was very young, I think he was 17, could be wrong, a year or so, but I believe he was about 17, 18 years old. He actually paroled from Vacaville <clears throat> Prison in the early 1980s. I made an attempt to track him down. I mean, not to talk to him, I'm just curious to know what happened to him. And, <clears throat> and the last I could find any report of him was that he was working as a house painter in Bakersfield, but that's probably 25 years ago. Uh, 
But Helter Skelter's coming. Some bad stuff is on its way. By your TV, we've got a bunch of gun smoke. Half gun will Look travel. Eyes, FBI, sorry. combat. Combat's my favorite show. I never miss combat. I always watch combat because the guy that was uh, the leading combat was doing it for some kind of cause, which they never, never told us. And uh, I'd wake up every morning, you know, early in the morning before anybody was up, and I'd turn on the cartoons. And uh, I'd watch 40 or 50 or 60 minutes of people shooting people. They'd uh, make it exciting, you know, they'd be on stagecoaches or with whips or whatever, you know, snide and whiplash. And they'd make them, you know, characters that would catch the kids' attention. And um, this guy you were looking to for, you know, entertainment or whatever you want to call it was uh, killing all through the show. Every show we ever watched was all killing, all those old-time gangster movies where... Uh, you know, it was all exciting. They were in the cars with the little hats on, and they were cruising, and they were shooting out the windows, or, you know, it was all exciting. And, and uh, we are what you made us. Exactly. So what? what's the big deal? Five or six people get killed, and uh, you all freak out and put it on us, and uh, we're just reflecting you back at yourself. Well, interesting Creepy. stuff. The woman on the left doing the talking did 10 years in prison for extortion. Uh, the woman on the right, of course, as we know, tried to assassinate President Ford. But that was filmed in 1970 during the trials. Uh, so October 10, 1969, they were out <coughs> in the desert. They were out at the ranch owned by the aunt of um, one of his young followers. And there had been a lot of reports to the forest rangers, to the sheriff's department, that there are these hippies out there who are destroying, uh, you know, heavy-duty equipment. So if they saw any kind of like a bulldozer or anything, they would trash it. They would set it on fire. So the, <clears throat> the, there was a combined effort of, of a couple of different various <coughs> law enforcement agencies, and they did a major bust of the ranch. Uh, where the Manson family was staying. It was October 10th, 1969, and they arrested, <coughs> they arrested really almost all of the key players. Manson, who was a very small man, it's interesting, I read when I was researching this, one of his followers has a website and said, how dare they say Charlie was a small man? He was tall. He was not tall. I mean, he was like five foot two. Anyway, he was hiding in a, in a little cabinet underneath this bathroom sink, I believe, when they found him. Mm -hmm. Well, something very similar. And uh, what's the problem for Charlie was they were supposed to keep things secret, but he told his followers that what they were doing was was all right. You know, they were doing this for the betterment of mankind, betterment of the white race. And the, the Manson family were uh, transferred to Los Angeles County. Susan Atkins was very proud of everything she'd done, and she told her roommate, uh, her roommate, her cellmate about it. The cellmate, of course, informed the authorities, and that was it for the Manson family. They were never going to get out after that. I feel compelled to explain that they were children. I keep emphasizing that they were children. Leslie Van Houten, incidentally, did not kill anybody. I mean, she, she walked away <laughs> around in the La Banca house in a totally dissociative state. They were all leaving, and Tex Watson said, you can't leave without doing something. We're all culpable. So she went back and stabbed a dead body with a fork. Not a good thing to do by any means. I just feel like I'm going to point that out. So then it was really all over. They had evidence. They had a massive amount of stuff. The trial really was a foregone conclusion. But let's listen to Charlie Manson explain it. But this time, he's not talking to emotionally battered, wounded, children. He's trying to explain this to a courtroom, and he's trying to explain this to adults, and his shtick is not going to work. In there, because... Sorry. Don't you want me to make you? It's coming down fast, but don't let it break you. Tell me, tell me, tell me the answer. You may be a lover, but you ain't no dancer. Look out. Nothing to madness. 
case that goes on. You can't prove anything that happened yesterday. Now is the only thing that's real. You can try to prove that Columbus sailed on an ocean, but it's not the same ocean. It's a different ocean. It's a different world. Every day, every reality is a new reality. Every new reality is a is a new horizon, a brand new experience of living. I got a note last night from a friend of mine. He writes in this note that he's afraid of what he might have to do in order to save his reality, as I saved mine. You can't prove anything. There's nothing to prove. Every man judges himself. He knows what he is. You know what you are, as I know what I am. We all know what we are. Nobody can stand in judgment. They can play like they're standing in judgment. They can play like they stand in judgment and take you off and control the mass with your human body. And they can lock you up in penitentiaries and cages and put you on crosses as they did in the past. But it doesn't amount to anything. What they're doing is they're only persecuting a reflection of themselves. They're persecuting what they can't stand to look at in themselves. The truth. They can't stand to look at the truth in themselves. They persecute themselves. They're butchering themselves every time they go on the freeway. They hate themselves. Look at the signs. Stop. Go. Turn here. Turn there. You can't well, do this. You can't do that. Let me point out that Manson did not convince anybody. He was <laughs> found guilty. And I wanted to end it, you know, because I keep emphasizing this, because when I you know, I, I worked at San Quentin as a psychologist for a long time and I taught it at the doctoral level in forensic psychology courses, you know, and people have this image of this evil cabal, the Manson family, and um, certainly bad, horrible things were done by the Manson family under his influence. I'm not at all minimizing the horror and the damage that was done. It's important to remember they were children. And so I thought when I was putting this together, I would find a photograph of the Manson family. And, uh, but most of the photographs I found were like, they reminded me of like the boys who went bad in Lord of the Flies or something. You know, they just, <laughs> they didn't really capture the fact that these were kids. I mean, um, I was playing Little League, as I say, and I was an altar boy when uh, Diane Lake joined the Manson family. And so I found this photograph, which was taken in a, uh, kind of a creek behind Spawn Ranch. And Manson did something that's very common with a lot of cults. When, you're, when you doubt anything that your leader, the, the master, the guru, or whoever it is, if you doubt him, it's very common for them to teach you a short mantra or something that you can say that when you're when you're doubting, when you're afraid, when you're wondering if maybe you've gone the right way, you say this little mantra, this little prayer, this little saying. And Manson actually had a song uh, that he wrote. He wrote, remember, over 150. And uh, he would have his followers sing the song. And it's not really a bad song. Uh, not a great song, but it's not a bad song considering that Manson wrote it. And it's the only song I found of Manson's where he doesn't sing in it. And this was a song that they were to sing or to say to themselves silently when they were thinking, well, you know, maybe Manson's not God. Maybe this isn't really going to happen. And uh, I thought we would just end with the Manson family singing their song. biological mother because he wanted to know who the father was. Louis Charles Manson. Manson. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, I read about that. Yeah, there, they had a lot, of, he, he fathered a lot of them and they had odd names. Uh, you might remember because you just read the book more recently. I think one of them was something like Zuzu, Zaza, Zizi. Uh, they had, yeah, that's all I remember, something like that. Oh yeah, and I think another one was called Pooh Bear. Um, yeah. There's, 
Yes, there's some Manson progeny out there. It's very uh, statistically improbable, but possible that there's somebody in this audience who's Charles Manson's biological child. Wow. <laughs> I'm Irish. I am Irish. <laughs> so am I. Not me. No, no. We'd be looking for somebody, well, you would fit the criteria, somebody between like 45 and 47. So there we go. Yes. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm, oh, I'm blanking out on it. Um, I can give you my card if you want, and I'll send you a link. Uh, I'll send you the information. I actually, because once you get immersed in something, as Jeannie, who's a wonderful scholar, will tell you, research is a slippery slope. You know, finally you just say, where do you stop? You know, mm -hmm. and so I actually ended up. I have several CDs of Charles Manson music, if anybody's really, uh, maybe the, if I ever do this again, we'll just do it all his music. Let his music speak for him. Yes? I always wondered, just what's the difference between the social patterns that we have? Well, there's a... And the second question is, what's the difference between the social patterns that we have and what we have in the a wonderful, a wonderful point, and I'm glad you brought both of those up. And if there's a sociologist in here, I'll get an argument, and I, and I won't argue with you. I just know I'm right. So there we go. So, uh, socio a sociopath and a psychopath are essentially the same thing. Sociologists tend to think a sociopath is somebody who's a psychopath, but he didn't have. Well, I'll just say it's a he because most of them, there are women psychopaths too, but most. Statistically, more men than women, so let's just say he for simplicity's sake. Um, so they would say, okay, yeah, he's a sociopath and he's unredeemable, but he didn't have to be this way. He had such a horrible upbringing, his upbringing made him this. Whereas a psychopath is somebody, and this research is supporting the, the validity of the psychopath opposed to the sociopath, but I don't feel compelled to argue about that right now to any sociologists in here, that it's genetic. When they've mm -hmm. done different brain scans, um, interestingly, I have a chapter on psychopaths in my book, so there you go. So anyway, they're, uh, they're actually their frontal lobes are even different. It's uh, I'd like to think of them as a, um, an intraspecies almost, a predator intraspecies, because they're devoid of empathy. They, they're not capable of empathy. Uh, and interestingly, while we're on the subject, between one and three percent, it's, it's, it's <clears throat> very probable. Uh, the research supports the fact that between one and three percent of the adult population is a, are psychopaths. But that doesn't mean they're mass murders. But if you start to look at you can find all the examples. Well, look at Enron. Look at Bernie Madoff. They didn't murder anybody, but they destroyed lives. These are people without empathy. There are certain kind of professions where they do very well. Um, so they're all out there. So it's uh, surgery. <laughs> surgery. I, I've, I've read that 15 percent of surgeons are apparently. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I would say the surgeons I've met have been devoid of a whole lot of empathy. I don't know. Um, I'm reluctant to call my orthopedic surgeon a social psychopath, but I would say that he seemed to be immune to the pain I was experiencing because he was drawing, he was drawing, draining my knee and it hurt a lot. And I said, doctor, you know, that really hurts. And I remember what he said, he goes, ha, 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 it's supposed to hurt. <laughs> so that's really the difference. Uh, the research supports the fact that psychopaths are born, uh, not made, where sociopaths are essentially made by the, their environment they grew up in. So how did, uh, just a second part, because that was interesting. Oh, right. Did, well, I didn't did say Did any that. of them realize what they were? Yes, thank you. I, and I actually meant to say that, and I got sidetracked, and I, uh, because there's so much. <laughs> uh, a lot of them did. A couple of them stayed hardcore. Squeaky Fromm and Susan, I'm, I'm so Atkins. Sorry, not Atkins, but, oh. which, um, but that was a good guess. I want to give you credit. <laughs> But because Susan Atkins was convicted, but there were two out there, and they were called red and, and blue, and they kept the, they tried to keep the Manson family alive. They moved to Stockton, but uh, I just talk about them briefly, and then they moved to Sacramento. But you know, times change, and they were still trying to recruit because they were saying Manson's the Messiah, he's innocent. And they were trying to recruit people for Manson's family into the mid 70s, but 
that was old stuff. Hippie Doug was dying. Nobody cared. Manson was a murderer. Was, um, and he wasn't there to influence them personally. So you had these two women who were attracted by American standards trying to recruit. So really, uh, Squeaky Fromm's reason for shooting President, trying to shoot President Ford was to attract attention for Manson, who was an innocent man being persecuted by the justice system in her mind. Uh, the other one, whose name I'm just blanking out on, um, she did extort. She was extorting, threatening, sending threatening letters to like, uh, you know, uh, uh, heads of corporations. They, here's something interesting about Manson: is he started an environmental movement, uh, ATWA, Air, Trees, Water, Air. So, if you if you're really curious, if you type ATWA on Google, you you'll probably get an ATWA website because Manson has followers even now. They're people who never knew him, uh, <clears throat> but they're attracted to the mystique. I, I work at Napa State Hospital and one of our patients who's acutely psychotic is one of them, but he's not going to be getting out anytime soon. But for most of them, your question was a good question and I meant to talk about it, is most of them dispersed. <clears throat> they were like leaves in the wind. They were, once Manson was gone, they there was no center to their lives, and, and some of them reclaimed their lives, and they, they prefer to remain anonymous. Uh, Diana Lake, um, Ruth Ann Morehouse, you know, apparently they have very good lives now, middle class lives, children, probably grandchildren now. So most of them just dispersed and did okay. <clears throat> some of them just kind of disappeared. Linda Kasabian's been in trouble with the law a lot. Uh, became a methamphetamine addict. Uh, last I heard, my brother sent me a news clipping about five years ago that she had been arrested for meth-related stuff. She was the, one of the Manson people at the Sharon Tate, and she actually turned state's evidence, so she never did any prison time. She testified against everybody else. Um, she got away with a lot. Um, there's the two remaining, I say Manson girls, but they're 65, 66, 67 years old, they're still in prison. Leslie became a good friend of mine. I worked on her parole hearings twice, but nobody wants to be the first parole board that lets one of them out. Um, you know, they look like middle-aged social workers. They're, I don't know. I don't, did I answer your question well enough? Uh, well, it's already your experience. I mean, yeah, you did, but also, I mean, psychologically, I mean, especially with the environment, they're not being physically yeah, well, I'll speak about Leslie, and by the way, I visited her a few months ago, and I said, you know, I'm going to do this talk, and I just want to make sure it's okay with you, and she says, please tell people about it, because she, she says people need to know how uh, about, she wasn't even speaking specifically about herself, but she said the more yes, people know, yes, I'm sorry. The mic. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I, how's that? that she, her point was the more people who know about manipulation and control, the better. Um, and so I can speak about her. She has two college degrees. Uh, she's got a master's in education. She does uh, tutoring because in the 1990s, it used to be possible for a prisoner to get a college education, which is a pretty cool thing because the research showed that the recidivism rate goes way down when somebody has a, when they're educated, less likely to go back to crime. Some do, uh, but I met people with college educations who did crimes. But in the mid-90s, that was banned because it was considered coddling to the inmates because they were getting Pell Grants. Um, and so when that happened, the college programs in the prison shut down. Uh, San Quentin has one, but it's run by Patton Call uh, University in Oakland, a small <laughs> Christian school. But I actually did a volunteer class there, and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, no religious overtones to it at all. I taught a clinical psych class there before I worked at San Quentin. So what a junior a community college in Southern California does is um, they videotape, or I uh, uh, the lectures by the professors, and then they show them in the prison, and Leslie is there to oversee that, and then she admitted, passes out the tests and tutors. So they find ways to be useful. Bobby Buzalil, um, who Gary, Gary Hinman, he's married, he has a website. He was a very talented musician. He was very much part of the San Francisco hippie movement. Um, 
So he has a web page that his wife maintains. You can buy his CDs there. Uh, he's in prison. He's in prison. You can't. You have to order them from his wife, not from him. Uh, uh, Tex Watson became a uh, born again Christian, as did uh, Susan Atkins, and they both wrote books about their conversion. Watson has a whole bunch of children he had when conjugal visits were permitted for uh, lifers. That's cut off now. Uh, Patricia Quinwinkle is in her late 60s and looks like she's 80. Uh, Susan Atkins died of a brain tumor a few years ago. That's probably all. And Charlie, Charlie Manson's in prison forever. He will never get out. It's a safe bet, and he knows that. And I don't think he even cares, frankly. So, he doesn't seem regretful. No, he denies essentially, you know, he says, hey, I didn't kill anybody. You know, they're a free spirit. They can do what they want. Why would you hold me responsible for what somebody else did? Essentially, that's his message. What's interesting, though, about the trial is he orchestrated it all because they were all still under his control. Their public, uh, their, their public defenders wanted to tr tr uh, try the girls separately because they could bring in undue influence. Milgram was still living. You had other prominent, Margaret Singer. There were a lot of... Uh, a lot of prominent people, they could have <clears throat> come in and testified. I'm not saying that they would have gotten out of jail, they would have found guilty, but maybe they wouldn't have gotten the death penalty. <clears throat> but Manson wouldn't let it. He, he orchestrated the whole uh, trial. He, they were all there together, and he had these little hand signals that he would do, and that would mean that the girls were supposed to start giggling or singing. Or It was pretty farcical, actually. Uh, yes? You mentioned that your students in Argentina recognize the Manson's name and maybe the Manson cult. Are you aware of other Manson-like cults in other cultures? Well, it's cultures? interesting. A close friend of mine is uh, on the faculty of the University of Buenos Aires, and she was telling me about one I haven't started the research on because she was thinking, oh, that would be a fun thing to research. She was saying, Patrick, we could write a book about it. You know, that's all the academics always want to write books, right? So, But I haven't followed up on it. But there are always these variations. You know, it's an interesting thing because most groups kind of dissipate when the leader dies unless they're big enough to be self-supporting, like Mormons. Just for the record, because I don't feel like being sued, I'm not saying that Scientology is a cult, but you might want to look at the six criteria that Margaret Singer says and judge for yourself, okay? But it was such a big empire when uh, Hubbard died that they were able to sustain themselves okay. The cult that I studied for <clears throat> my dissertation, it still exists, and it's interesting because it had a charismatic leader named Reverend Bill, true psychopath, but he was really charismatic, and I was always afraid to talk to him for, for more than a few minutes because, um, well, well, he, he made me uncomfortable, <laughs> for one thing, and I was always afraid he would figure out what I was doing. I didn't lie to get in, but they misinterpreted my reasons that I gave him. I had to sign a statement, <clears throat> and I did not lie to him. Uh, but perhaps, no, I didn't lie to them. They just misunderstood what I said. <laughs> a sin of omission. And it's interesting when really quickly when Reverend Bill died, because it wasn't a big group, about 80 people, I thought that they would fold because it really wasn't big enough to sustain itself. And he had two wives. One he mar married 30 or 40 years ago. She was an enforcer, Reverend Angela, who was a scary person. When she walked into that room, a chill filled the air. Then he mar married a very young woman, too. She was Reverend, Rev Reverend Debbie. So I figured it'd be interesting to follow him because it'd be a turf battle between the two. But they were wise enough to know they had a good thing going, so they share the power, and that group's still going. <laughs> uh, once in a while, they make the newspapers, and I've been quoted a couple times. Um, anyway, that's probably all I have to say. We have time for one more question, if there is one. I fear that I didn't answer your question adequately, did I? Uh, mostly. Kind of, yeah, kind of, well, yeah, I want to put it more because I think, I think there's a couple, like, I have a, a, a couple of therapists who just kind of say, you know, the people who have, have the worst time, like, if you all have bad relationships with people, like, you can kind of bring them yeah. to turn against themselves, just come at it. He yeah. said, you know, people who have the most psychological trouble, the people who have really manipulative therapists, or cult leaders, well, because they're so sophisticated. I don't know if you 
that could happen. There was a cult, a very popular cult in the early 70s that was run by two psychology professors. I think they were at UCLA. And that can happen. There's, uh, here's an interesting stuff. I'm a psychologist. Go on the Board of Psychology website and it'll list everybody who's had their license, a license revoked or suspended. And, and the reasons, the overwhelming majority is uh, sexual impropriety. So you get... No, well, people, we, you know, we, we have great amount of resilience, and the reason I couldn't be more elaborative about the ones who survived is because they don't want people to interview them. They've got different names, they've settled, they have lives, they, this was a horrible thing that happened to them when they were children, and they don't want to be associated with it at all anymore. So, you know, we really can't track, only the more, most notorious ones can you track down, even Steve Brogan, you know, a house painter in Bakersfield in the mid-80s, and then he disappeared. He probably changed his name. I don't blame him. He doesn't want to be associated with Manson. Yeah, okay. Well, let us thank Dr.